I'm going to just introduce our moderator. Um, Kendall Fitch is a third year in the, of the uh, joint degree between the business school and the Kennedy School. She's graduating in a few weeks um, after having spent some time with us. And uh, Kendall is um, also a George Fellow this year. And um, she uh, volunteered for this duty in part because she has a little bit of history with the Gates Foundation. I'll let you talk a little bit about that. But thank you both, and uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Adam. Um, yes, yeah, so in 2008, I was working at the Gates Foundation uh, at the time of the launch of what is now post-secondary success. It's an initiative there that uh, is focused on improving college completion rates for low-income adults. And I just met with my colleague, Josh Garrett, this morning. Great. To talk to you. Very good. The program is still doing very well, so that was exciting. Uh, that's why I have the honor to be up here today. I'm very excited about it. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. I'm going to start with your bio. Okay. Uh, with introduction, and then we'll give you some time for remarks.
although it can involve some high technology like what Josh is doing, it's a broader set of, of things. And so part of the fun for me has been to apply what I learned from business in an appropriate way. Because not everything I learned translates uh, into philanthropy, but learn what I, I've, uh, or take what I've learned and try and apply, apply in an appropriate way in order to raise the, the level and quality of philanthropic impact that we, that we aspire to. So, you know, maybe I should, should stop there and kind of turn it over to how you want to do the questions. Great, sounds good. Well, I think we'll start with a bit of a softball question. Okay. So, um, now that you said you went from 100 to 90,000 employees, uh, tell me the scale of the foundation might not have grown quite as rapidly, but it's grown quite quickly. So can you talk a bit, since you, you joined in 2008, that's about right when I was leaving, was there a correlation? <laughs> <laughs> uh, certainly not. But I, uh, could you talk a bit about sort of what the scope and the scale of the foundation's work today? What areas are you in? Okay. Uh, is it going to continue to grow or yeah. sort of reach an ideal size? Yeah. Well, the, the, so the foundation, I would say the last decade of the Gates Foundation has very much been one of high growth. Uh, just take the last you know, six, seven years, the foundation has quadrupled. It was about 250 employees, probably roughly one, 1.2 billion in annual payout. It's now over 1,000 employees and about uh, 4 billion in annual uh, payout. So, so clearly there's been a, a lot of growth in, the, in the, the last decade. And a big part of what I try to do is bring uh, the sort of structure, processes, approach that will lead to greater capacity for impact. Uh, our structure for all of you is, is that we, we really work in three distinct uh, areas, and we think of them as three distinct areas, global health, global development, and the U.S. program. Global health is largely focused in on trying to reduce the infectious disease burden in the developing world, especially for young children. Uh, it's still stunning to me to think that there are roughly eight to nine million kids each year who die under the age of five. Uh, the largest group, I'm sorry, am I doing something wrong in terms of the, it's okay. Yeah, the uh, largest percentage of those kids are, are dying in the developing world of preventable, preventable diseases. And, you know, the way I think of it is equity. You know, take vaccines. Our kids grow up having access to life-saving vaccines. And why shouldn't those kids have the access to those, those vaccines? Uh, probably uh, 40 to 50 percent of those deaths could be prevented just by more effective use of, of vaccines. About, uh, of those 8, 9 million kids, about um, uh, you know, 3.6 million or so die in the first 28 days of their life. Neonatal mortality. 98% of those deaths are in the developing world. Two-thirds of those deaths are due to preterm birth, uh, birth asphyxia, or sepsis, severe infection. You know, these are things that we figured out how to take advantage of in the rich world. Why shouldn't the developing world have access uh, to, those, to those capabilities? So, you know, it, it's, that's the kind of thing that we work on in global health. And back to be working with smart, passionate people who really want to change the world. I mean, that's a, that's a great example. Uh, another thing that I think is, is important is there's a roughly 1.2, 1.3 billion people in the world who live in extreme poverty. That is a definition of people who live, are living on a dollar or less per day. Uh, now, about 265 to 75% of those people live in rural areas. That means they're dependent on subsistence agriculture. So what could you do to transform the productivity of smallholder farm families so that they would be able to feed themselves, that's food security, so that they would have enough surplus, they have a little bit of income to educate their kids, to be able to have access to health interventions and other things that would really change their, their lives. So that is the focus of our global development uh, program, agricultural development, financial services for the poor, water sanitation, and hygiene. And in the U.S. program, I think we, we focus in on, 
on education because the mission of the foundation, and I should have set this up front, the mission of the foundation is to enable all people to live healthy and productive lives. You know, Bill and Melinda's founding principle was all lives have equal value. But these issues of equity that I just described to you show that the world does not operate delivering uh, on that principle. So we dedicate ourselves to what can we do to make a, a difference in, in that way. In the U.S., the big inequity, we believe, is, is access to quality education. I found it stunning. When I came to the foundation, I had no idea that roughly 30% of our kids in the U.S. do not graduate from high school. 30%? That's embarrassing. 30? Okay. Of those who do graduate from high school, we believe that roughly one half of them are prepared to succeed in college. Okay. So now we're talking about a third. They, we're, we're in the 21st century. I mean, this, the, you know, this we talk about the, the information economy, the knowledge economy. We talk about most of the job growth being in, with with bachelor degree or better um, uh, education. Yet those are our education statistics. You know, it, it's just it's just not acceptable. And so, you know, I think one of the things I find motivating for myself is to think about those numbers and really understand what we as a society need to, to do to make a difference. And so the U.S. program is largely taking on this issue of how can you transform U.S. public education in a way that would significantly change that and, and open up opportunities to then increase the number of, of post-secondary credentials, which is uh, the program. So, Sorry, Kendall, a long description, but founding principle, mission of the foundation, three divisions, roughly 25 program strategies, all the way from eradicating polio to uh, U.S. high school education. Sounds great. Um, focus on things you're now getting to be a farmer a little bit. Yeah. Uh, Finally, I'm, after all these years, I'm getting back to ag policy. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Um, with that, why don't we talk a little bit about um, the purpose of philanthropy, as you see the purpose. Every once when I was working at Case, um, I think it was actually Josh who mentioned this, that one way of thinking about philanthropy is as the venture capital of the public sector. And I know that really resonated with me. I like that idea. You try to identify really great um, opportunities, you support them financially and, um, you know, as sort of administrative assistance as well, if possible, with the hope that those proof points then might get adopted in the public sector and be able to brought, be brought to scale or you know, reallocate public dollars for more efficient uses. Is that happening now? Or what do, you, uh, what do you Well, think first of all, I think you need to step back a little bit. I actually think philanthropy is quite a broad area. And you have to, to, and I think one of the things that is missing from philanthropy today is to be very intentional about the, the various aspirations for impact, the various operating models, et cetera. You know, I might almost think of it in terms of segments. I'd say one segment of philanthropy is charity. There's not necessarily a theory of change in that segment, but what you're doing is you're using your uh, resources to try and fill in gaps in society that make a difference for people. That's goodness. And, you know, whether it's supporting United Way or other activities uh, or supporting scholarships. A second segment of philanthropy, I would say, is organization building. You as the philanthropist don't necessarily own the theory of change, but you're betting on an individual, an organization, a social entrepreneur who does have a theory of change. Saul Khan, Khan Academy. He has a theory of change, and many people are betting on Saul. They're investing in his organization. I call that segment word building. The third segment is the one that you referenced, which I call catalytic philanthropy or strategic philanthropy. But I think it's important to understand there are multiple segments of philanthropy. They're all good. I actually think the Gates Foundation participates in all three uh, of the segments, as does the Rakes Foundation. You know, my wife and I have our own private foundation. And I think in catalytic philanthropy, Kendall talked on, touched on what I consider to be one of the most important points. The we're big believers in the private sector. Capitalism has been an effective system to allocate resources in society to produce goods and services. 
It works especially well when there's a clear market opportunity and there is a risk opportunity for the capitalist to make an investment to undertake uh, the development of something innovative and, and then reap the benefits of that reward. It does not work well when there's not a market opportunity, sometimes described as a market failure. Public sector is also very important. The public sector allocates resources to produce goods and services for society, but is less inclined to take risk. After all, it's your tax dollars. So in the private sector, you'll have risk takers. In the public sector, not as much risk taking. We think the sweet spot for catalytic philanthropy is to identify those areas of quote unquote market failure or where the public sector is not going to make the initial investment to take the underlying risk of investing in innovative interventions that will address uh, an issue. Maybe it's neglected infectious diseases in sub-Saharan Africa. No market opportunity. Those are poor people, yet big societal benefit if you can invent the vaccines or the medicines or the other medical interventions that will make a difference. So as a social, uh, as a catalytic philanthropist, if we undertake that risk, that social risk, provide the underlying evidence of efficacy against those problems, so that then you can encourage either a private sector and or a public sector scale up of those. Because while the Gates Foundation is viewed as a big philanthropy, the truth is even at four billion, it's a small percentage of the overall resources that we're working on. Our US education investment is less than 0.1% of the overall spending on US education. So if we're gonna have an impact, we have to think as a catalyst. So how can we develop the evidence of successful interventions that then prove worthy of allocating public sector dollars or reallocating public sector dollars in order to scale up and have a greater impact? Or can we prove that the use of mobile phone technology and agent banking will transform the underlying economics of banking to where it will lower the overall cost and make it feasible for poor people to have a safe place to save their money. That would be a scale-up strategy for the private sector, probably supported by the public sector. So that three-legged stool, private sector, public sector, catalytic philanthropy, I view is the sweet spot of what we're trying to do at the Gates Foundation. Thank you. I'll, uh, I'll describe that to people well, you did a good job. And could you talk about what are the the skill sets and the, the qualities of the people that you want to surround yourself with in the mission? What are you looking for when you're thinking about the team that you're going to build, whether it's in the private sector or the public sector? Yeah, well, Early on in my Microsoft career, um, especially in the, the you know 1981-82 era, we were doing things that hadn't been done in in computing, just because the personal computing industry was new. So if I made it a point to go out and hire experience, I wouldn't have found anybody. Plus, I was 23 years old. I wouldn't have even known what to look for. So um, early on, uh, and I got great coaching uh, from a Harvard alum named Steve Ballmer, who hired me at Microsoft, that the key things I really needed to focus in on were three qualities. The first two were high energy and high horsepower. High energy basically means people are passionate about what they do. And I look for whether their eyes light up when they talk about something that is really important to them. You know, high horsepower means that they're, they're they're smart, they learn. It's not necessarily, I'm not a huge believer in sort of the whole, you know, IQ test type of thing. I'm looking for street smart. I'm looking for people who, who learn uh, and learn quickly from their experiences. Because we were doing a lot of things that hadn't been done, so we were going to have to learn. I put it in my first two years, I did a lot of uh, MBA recruiting from Harvard, Stanford, uh, MIT. I, I, had, I had some great hires, but I learned in a couple of cases that I could hire really smart people, very uh, energetic, they work a lot of hours. But they didn't get anything done. <laughs> so then I added a third quality. Yeah. High energy, high horsepower, and they know how to get things done. I look for a results orientation. So 
you know, you, you've all benefited a great deal from your education here at Harvard, but the, frankly, the most important thing I would look for if I was asking, you know, if I was interviewing today, I'd be looking for those, those, those three things. Now, depending upon the role, you may look for a certain set of experiences or a certain set of value, value set. If somebody wants to come to the Gates Foundation because of the aura of the, the Gates Foundation, yeah, that, that's a little dangerous. And we have that problem. You know, uh, I want I want somebody who really is going to kind of dig in and, and, and get the, the job done. And it's it's hard work. I mean, it was in, even as hard as it was to build Microsoft Office, it is much harder to figure out how to effectively reinvest resources back into society that will really make a difference for societal good. And so I just, I just think it's really important that I get people who are willing to sign up for that tough mission. Okay. We'll, uh, we'll turn it over to okay. you. Um, thanks very much. Uh, actually, it's a great follow-on from what you just spoke about. My name's Joel, I'm a grad student here. Um, and from the perspective of graduating students and just generally people who are looking to go into not-for-profit um, sectors, we see something very peculiar going on that um, we're told public service and that what you're doing is important, but most not-for-profits are only hiring people with corporate experience increasingly, and they want management consultants to come in after they've done their five, six years at McKinsey or an equivalent and then come in. Um, one of the big challenges is that due to that, a lot of not-for-profits have to pay them quite excessively and it's staff salaries lower down the tree, making it basically unsustainable for people to move on if they may impacts in that in education you've got this self-fulfilling circle so my challenge to you is a as a hire and a ceo of one of the largest foundations in the world is how do you break the cycle and actually make internal growth and not-for-profit something that graduates from sort of universities want to go into rather than just being sucked into um, other parts just so that they can get the experience to go back out later yeah, two things. One is I'm, I'm going to disappoint you, Joe, in that I actually don't see the same the world the same way as you do. I don't actually see that cycle in quite the same way. Uh, but on the other hand, I do think uh, uh, we may generally agree that a, a, a variety of skill sets and experiences are quite valuable. So, And there are different ways to get that. Uh, you know, I, I frankly find that most people I encounter in philanthropy and nonprofits have not had, had business experience. And I actually think not, not everyone in the nonprofit sector should have business experience, but I think some private sector experience is quite valuable. And I'm actually excited to see a little bit of dialing that up in, in the, the philanthropy uh, sector. Um, so. You know, I think uh, back to, back to your point then about what the, what role the Gates Foundation uh, should play. I'll just tell you how we go about it. Is is that we, in terms of both our hiring and our compensation, what we'll do is we'll look at various roles that we need to fill, what set of skill sets and experiences that that, that we need, to what extent their compensation would be defined in a nonprofit world, to what extent it would be in a for-profit world. We do a blending of that depending upon the role in order to make sure that, that we do it well. And generally speaking, the, the non-profit compensation is substantially lower than the for-profit compensation. And I actually think that's not a good thing. Uh, you know, I'm, a, I'm an outlier case. You know, I took an 87% pay cut to come to the Gates Foundation. It didn't matter to me. But for other talent you might want to bring in to the nonprofit sector to do this good work, Basically, asking them to take 75% pay cuts or 50% pay cuts, I think, actually sub-optimizes the access to the talent you'd like having working on these problems. Thanks very much. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much for being here with us. Um, my name is Sushma, um, and I'm a dual degree student between the Harvard Kennedy School and the Kellogg School of Management. Um, and I, just linking off of your last response, I in some ways might be one of the groups of people you're talking about. Um, I spent 10 years in the nonprofit sector, founded three nonprofits, and now gone to business school, and I'm trying to pick up skills from different sectors. My question for you was um, about some trends I've seen within philanthropy and the emergence of impact investing. Um, I spent last summer with the MacArthur Foundation and with some folks here at the Kennedy School as well, 
and there's been a push towards moving more and more of the endowment um, of foundations um, towards mission vesting um, and um, to removing the Chinese wall, let's say, between endowments and grant making. What's interesting is foundations like yours and the MacArthur Foundation and the Ford Foundation, you have aggressive investing programs, but they're mostly the PRIs, um, the program-related investments, um, whereas the smaller foundations, from my understanding, have been aggressively pushing for more and more of their endowment to be mission investments. Um, I was really comforted by your remarks earlier, um, talking about the role for charity. And so I'm just wondering what your position is on this trend towards mission investing and what leadership role do you find um, organizations with the endowment size that you have um, doing in terms of exercising leadership? Yeah, well, it's a, it, it's a great question, uh, Sushman. And you're correct in that at the Gates Foundation, we tend to focus in on PRIs. For, the, the, for all of you, that refers to program-related investments. That's within our uh, Gates Foundation uh, um, operating budget. It's it's like making a grant, except that you're using a debt instrument or an equity instrument. Uh, there's some potential return of the capital. Uh, you uh, a lot of times it's used with private sector companies that you're trying to get to invest in a a nonprofit uh, activity. Now, Sushma makes the point that we have a separate investment company that manages our investments. And so there's the question, to what extent should we try and ask the investment company to make investments that they may feel are a less than market return, uh, given the opportunities they see, versus do the best they can to maximize the return within certain parameters, and then have greater resources to deploy to the Gates Foundation. We chose the latter path. For the most part, we don't do that former uh, thing, which is called mission-related investment. That's not to say it's not a good thing. It's just to say it's a different choice of how to get to, to the goal. In our case, we think we'll have the greater societal good by uh, appropriately maximizing the return of the endowment uh, by having the investment company be focused on that and then deploying those resources uh, to the Gates Foundation uh, activities. Other foundations make different choices. I, I actually think another very interesting approach is what Omidyar Networks is doing where only 50% of the capital of Omidyar is really focused within private foundation, and the other 50% is outside. It's not even an endowment. Because Pierre believes, and Matt Bannock believes, that what they can do is they can make investments in, in organizations that will produce great societal good and a return. I think that's great. I think they have a good model. It doesn't happen to be the model for us. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Mark. I'm an alum and currently direct a special project of Rockefeller Philanthropy Advisors. Um, my question actually was going to be related specifically to PRIs, but since uh, it happened to be already asked, um, I'll ask a different question related to energy. I'm curious, I mean, you have a number of different program areas focused on health, focused on education. Have you looked at energy either through the lens of those programs or perhaps as a separate program, both on the renewable side, which I think there's a lot of interest in and focus on, but also on the energy efficiency side? Because yeah. I feel like this energy efficiency is this giant sort of 800-pound gorilla in the room that's invisible that most people don't see. Yeah. We're, we're wasting hundreds of billions of dollars of energy we don't need to be consuming. And I'm wondering if you've looked at sort of either program-related investments in that area or grant-making in that area to sort of address those issues. Yeah, it's a... Uh, what two, it gives me the opportunity to make two points. One is, Bill and Melinda and I believe very strongly in the importance of focus. And so it, it's very easy to, you know, it's almost an oxymoron to say that we focus on 25 areas. <laughs> you know, it, it, and so right now I'm not looking to add the 26. On the other hand, we do consider energy to some extent within our programs, but actually the biggest energy work by far is done by Bill outside of the foundation. Bill thinking about energy policy, he's on a, 
uh, commission sponsored by President Obama with Jeff Elmo and others who are thinking about those those issues. And so uh, for, for Bill and Melinda, that's been their choice of how to, to take on issues of energy. Thanks. Hi, my name is Josh Harder. Thanks so much for, for coming. I've actually had the opportunity to work on a number of Gates projects in, in East Africa and elsewhere, and I'm a huge, huge admirer of the foundation. My question goes to um, a comment you made earlier about the, the, the uh, transition between the business sector and, 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 the, and the philanthropic uh, foundation. Obviously, a lot of backgrounds of past heads of the Gates Foundation have been from global health and, and other sorts of backgrounds, and not necessarily strictly business. So my question for you would be, um, what skills specifically did you find did not translate going from business to philanthropy, and what surprised you that you uh, would not have expected about that transition uh, going in in 2008? What's well, interesting, I'm going to take the second one first. Um, I'm a, my, my native personality is to ask a lot of questions. Uh, and so I'm very inquisitive. And when I uh, was offered and accepted the job to be the CEO of the Gates Foundation, I started asking people, uh, well, you know, how, how should I think about philanthropy? And, and you know, what, what approach? And you know, well, it's, it really, it's really different. You have to think different. Well, how, what, what suggestions would you make? Think differently, <laughs> and you know. Well, and, and so I just my mind, you know, which races a little bit at times. So it's just like, wow, I got to think differently. Got to think differently. So the number one surprise that I had coming into the Gates Foundation is that I had swung my mind so much to the notion that I had to think differently that actually I found it wasn't as different as. I thought it was going to be. You know, we were at that time a 750 person organization that had tripled in the previous three years. You know, as I mentioned, I was at Microsoft during the high growth era, so I've seen the kind of mistakes that get made or the kind of problems that occurred and, you know, sort of how the processes begin to break down or need to be invented, so on and so forth. All of those things were there at, at, at the Gates Foundation. And so, a big part of what I think I've done in my first three and a half years is taken advantage of what I learned from, from business uh, and figured out how to appropriately apply it at the Gates Foundation. One of the most common things you'll, you'll hear, was it Josh? Yes. One of the most common things you'll hear, Josh, is that, the, that in philanthropy you don't have a market system, so therefore you don't have the market signals for improvement. And that that's really different from business. That's true. You know, I'm a board member of Costco. Costco gets to look at their daily, you know, daily sales results and so on and so forth. Yet on the other hand, most of my career I worked in long-term R&D, where I had products under development that were at, weren't actually out in the market. And when you have projects like that, you have to have a disciplined mindset to set a goal to use various types of uh, market, or sorry, various types of non-market metrics to gauge your progress, so on and so forth. And that's a lot of what we have to do in our, our work. It's a lot of long-term uh, type R&D. And so even that, where people said it was going to be so different, it is different, but maybe not as different uh, as, we, was, as, as people would think. I have encountered some differences in the culture. Uh, and they, there are some good things about that, and there are some negative things. Um, you know, and, the, and, the, and this is just not the culture of the Gates Foundation, the culture of philanthropy. And it goes a little bit like this. You know, Kathy, isn't it great that we're here at the Gates Foundation, you know, working together to, to change the world? Isn't that great that we're here together? And of course, we'll agree on how we should work together to change the world. There's sort of this nicey nice consensus thing sometimes where people don't want to mix it up. And that's actually really dangerous for effective philanthropy. The kind of problems that we're taking on, like eradicating malaria, these are like 40-year goals where people don't really know what the solution is. So here's a, a, a rule of thumb for you. The bigger the goal and the more ambiguous the solution, the more important it's going to be to get a rich set of intellectual dialogue, a diverse set of inputs to come together and to figure out what that solution will be. 
And if you're worried about offending your colleague because you might have a different point of view, that is suboptimal for the kind of culture that is necessary. There was much more of a comfort level of mixing it up at Microsoft than I've seen at the Gates Foundation. And, and I'm not going to defend some elements of Microsoft culture either. But I am going to say that I think it's important that we figure out the right way to make sure that people speak up, share their points of view, have that rich intellectual dialogue. A lot of why I'm here in, in Boston is not just to be here at Harvard, but to engage with people who are critical of our education work, because I want to learn from them. I want to understand their point of view. I think we might it might make our work better, and in any case, I think it will help us explain our work better. That has to be central to what we do. And that's something that you do in business. You watch competitors. You understand what their strengths are and what their weaknesses are. Similarly, we have to understand who our opponents are, what they're thinking, why they might be right, why they might be wrong, what that will do to make us better on behalf of the, the, the people we want to serve. Thank you. Um, that's just a great setup for the question I want to ask you. My name is Mark. I'm going to roll on that. Yeah, you are. <laughs> it's a great role. And I work at the Harvard Decision Science Laboratory, which is part of the Center for Public Leadership. I'm also on the board of a startup that does food security work with farmers in East Africa. But the question that I have for Which you, countries? Uh, Tanzania and Kenya. Okay. But the question I have for you is about decision making. So I work here with a lot of scientists who study human decision making. And what they teach us is we all have a lot of cognitive biases. We know what they are. We can study them pretty carefully. We understand how emotion, how our neuroendocrine system move us off the path of rational thinking. We all learn about that. We are not good at building ways of protecting ourselves against those things in the decisions we make. So my question is, at a place like the Gates Foundation, where what you do is make decisions, do you think about how you make decisions? Mm -hmm. Do you have a systematic way of reflecting on your decision-making process? And do you also work with your grantees to have that conversation and get them better at the decisions they make? And if so, how? Yeah, the, the, I'm going to disappoint you a little bit and I think that the work on, that we're doing on, on decisions is the most basic work. Like, who's going to make the decision? <laughs> and when are they supposed to make it? Uh, it actually relates to the thing I was saying earlier, uh, where I was leveraging Kathy. And I was saying kind of, you know, they, they um, let me frame it this way. Whenever you go into a new organization, listen to the funny phrases that people use. It's indicative of the culture of the organization. Like one of the phrases I heard people talk about was overly collaborative. And I said, overly collaborative? What does that mean? And the, the lady said to me, well, what it means is, is that we don't know who's going to make the decision, but we know that everybody's going to be, want to be involved in making the decision. You know, and well, that's not a healthy thing. You know, you do want to be caught, because I'll tell you what happens, is that you learn with these kinds of behaviors, these kinds of values, there's the unintended consequences, there's the counter major, and I'm sure you think about this in, in your line of work. So what is the counter on overly collaborative? I don't want to involve Kathy, because Kathy might disagree with me. And if our culture is such that we're supposed to agree, then it's better just not to involve her. You know, and so then you don't get the collaboration. And so that's the dichotomy of overly collaborative. It drives people to not collaborate. And so that's one of the things I've really been working with people on is just getting, my theory is if you just get clear about who's going to make the decision, who's going to provide input, who's not going to provide input but needs to be informed, what time frame the decision is going to be made, we just call this hygiene, just cleaning things up so you get that level of clarity. If you have that level of clarity, then it actually will improve the decision-making processes and operate on this overly collaborative problem. Because then I'll feel comfortable asking Kathy, because even if I get her input, I don't have to make her happy. Uh, I can I can uh, just go ahead and, and you know I appreciate the input, but I've made a different decision, uh, and this is this is why. Uh, I want to bring bring one one other thing that I think is super important in philanthropy and not well understood. 
change management. <coughs> There's a whole world of discipline around change management, um, the processes of change management. And I actually find change management hard in the Gates Foundation, which is a little scary because we, you know, we're, we've grown rapidly, we've got to improve our processes, that means we need to make changes, we need to be appropriately collaborative, we need to have the appropriate rigor, that means we have to make changes in our behavior. So we have to be really good at change management in order to be the best we can be. But even more important, we have to have that skill and discipline in order to appropriately serve the ultimate uh, uh, consumer of our work because it's all about them changing behavior. So I don't know what you're doing with smallholder farmers in East Africa, but I'm almost certain it involves aspects of them changing their behaviors. And the level of discipline in change management and the understanding of that and the focus on that in, in philanthropy, it might be there more than I see, but I certainly don't see it very much. So I aspire to have our organization be excellent at change management internally and externally so that we can better support the people who will benefit from our interventions. <coughs> you know, so, I am thank you. I believe part of your question was also saying how do you incorporate grantee, grantee feedback into decision making, is that correct? Are you teaching and grantee I think that you. I That's one of my aspirations, but I'd say we're just at the very early days. The question was, am I teaching, are we teaching grantees about change management? I think we have to do more on that. Your question was a little different. Incorporating grantee feedback into the decision making foundation. While I was there, I thought that you guys did an excellent job of that. So maybe you could speak a little bit about how you incorporate that. Yeah. You go above and beyond. What Kendall may be referring to is that we did an excellent job of surveying uh, our the perceptions of our grantees with their relationship uh, with us. And frankly, what we did an excellent job of was understanding that we're, we weren't nearly as good as we needed to be. Uh, and a lot of it goes back to, to, to just being uh, focused and intentional. Uh, a good portion of our grantees, we've grown so rapidly, a good portion of our grantees didn't know who their primary contact was at the Gates Foundation. You know, that's just a basic thing we needed to, to clean up and, and fix. More importantly is that uh, we needed to do a little bit better of an orientation process when they were coming on board as a grantee so that we were mutually clear on how the grantee management was going to work. And so there were just a set of things like that that we had to, to do to improve our approach. And we're still working uh, on that. The ultimate aspiration is you really have to think of your grantees as your partners, that you're working together to achieve that ultimate impact. And that means you have to have that rich intellectual dialogue, not only internally, but externally with the partners. And I think that we have to, we have to be better at that. Thank you for uh, the talk. My name is Leila, I'm a mid-career student. And it's actually following a bit Mark's question, but I'm thinking in terms, well, of course, I don't estimate, <coughs> underestimate the importance of charity programs like for vaccinations and malaria and all this, but how much of a role would you say does the Bill Gates Foundation have in some preventive uh, issues that are really a big concern for the world that reproduce health problems. For example, um, some of like spiritual emptiness and unemployment are leading actually to militarization and I would say destructive religiousness in the world. So how much sustainable, empowering programs is, is the foundation thinking of? So it's again thinking of visions and values in the foundation, I guess. Yeah, oh, I think I think that that those domains are extremely important. But it goes a little bit back to my question on focus. Uh, there are things that we are are good at, and there there are some things that that actually other organizations are going to be good at or, or better at. And we tend to be good thing, better at things that involve uh, underlying science and technology, like how can you produce a more cost-effective pneumonia vaccine. Uh, and we are probably less good at some of the things that you, that you raised. I'm just thankful that the, the culture of philanthropy, especially here in the United States, 
encourages philanthropists to pursue their passions. And so there are organizations that focus in on those those areas, and that and that's that's goodness. That's what the world needs. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. I'm sure. Meyer Batchelder, and I'm a big career student in business history. Um, I'm a big career student here at the Kennedy School, and I've spent actually the past 11 years working in sexual and reproductive health nonprofit organizations in, on the national and international level. And I was very excited about Melinda Gates' recent TED Talk on family planning and the unmet need, and as well as the um, No Controversy website that was created. And I was wondering about the Gates Foundation's plans in this arena, and if they're planning to really focus in on the unmet need for contraception moving forward. The answer is yes. Uh, we have had a focus in on, on, on family planning, and in particular, uh, the support for the unmet need for contraception. Part of what we have done is work on R&D that would improve either the uh, improve the, in particular, the cost equation on existing alternatives because, you know, the cheaper it is, the more that you can supply, but also some new contraceptive uh, approaches like non-hormonal approaches that may be important in certain, in certain areas. But in addition, trying to understand how we can make, uh, how we can support improvements to the delivery systems that would increase the access. Because as Melinda pointed out, a good portion of it can be just the, the uh, stock outs in the supply system. The good news is the UK government is getting significantly behind this as they did a year ago with vaccines in Gavi. And so I anticipate some major announcements where a number of, of countries, both donor countries and developing countries, uh, are going to come together with an aspiration to significantly try and close some of the unmet need for contraception, which is estimated at this point in time in the range of 200 to 225 million women of reproductive age. So it's a very, very important issue. You know, in some respects, if we if we collectively uh, wanted to have a big impact on you know reducing environmental consequences long term, just giving women access to what they want to plan their families to space the births would have a huge impact on population uh, growth not so much in the near term uh, but in the 15 20 30 year range why not so much in the near term it just takes time if you look at population demographics but that means it's all the more urgent to get after it today and we hope that we can effectively communicate that message this summer Correct, July 11th. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much for being here. Um, my name is Catherine, and I'm an MPP1 here, originally from Kentucky. My question is about the role of advocacy within the Gates Foundation, uh, specifically for public policy. I know Dr. Stanford, I think, um, had set up and I- Say it again, the role of what? Oh, advocacy for oh. public policy. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I'm excited that an HKS you know, alum is, um, is in that role. I'm wondering, though, if for the Gates Foundation, it's just a matter of scaling up the solutions that you all have proven to be effective, or if it is also about uh, convincing you know, policymakers to adopt solutions that we already know are effective. Um, and either way, my second question is, has the Gates Foundation considered creating a 501c4 branch that you know, is free of some of the legal restrictions uh, that traditional nonprofits face around lobbying? Yeah. Uh... And I'm sorry, was Mich Michelle? No. Oh, that's my sister's name, but I'm Catherine. <laughs> <laughs> and this is Dr. Sanford. Better known to us as Stephanie. Uh, <laughs> so she can give you the, the, the real run -up. Two things. One is, if you think about what I was saying earlier on catalytic philanthropy, advocacy is very important because effectively what you want to do is you want to, to use it, a base of evidence to appropriately influence public sector resource allocation to scale up and sustain the, the, the interventions that have the, the base of evidence of their, their efficacy. So advocacy is a very important part of what we do. You know, there are times where I might suggest to you that the if you're doing an evaluation of the assets of the Gates Foundation, the voice of the foundation and Bill and Melinda and our leadership might actually be an even greater asset than the financial resources. You know, we, we I, I think, and that puts a lot of pressure on us 
to make sure that we're really clear about the evidence, that we're really uh, pushing on the, the, the right approach and so on and so forth. And it's tricky because we also have to, if we're going to have the impact that we talked about earlier, we have to take some risk. And so you you got to be clear about, you have to make, take smart risks, you have to be clear about what you're trying to learn, so on and so forth. But advocacy is an important part of, of what we do for that reason. The 501c4 is an interesting uh, approach, and, and we haven't chosen to do that at this time. Uh, I wouldn't preclude it for the future, but frankly, uh, we feel that we can get done uh, most or all of what we want to do by being within the bounds of the regulations for a 501c3. You know, we don't feel like we have to go out and, and advocate for specific uh, uh, candidates or specific legislation. What we can do is we can share the base of information that policymakers need to have more informed decisions and get done what we need to do. That, you know, we might think of that evolution in the future, but that's not something we've decided to do at this time. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Gene Timiho. Uh, my question is about effectiveness of aid. Um, I worked uh, in an area where Joseph Kony, who became recently notorious, worked. Mm -hmm. And for over a year, it was very difficult for us to raise funding, even though the atrocities were 10 times worse than now. At the same time, we see in other places that there are thousands of NGOs, 2,000 or 3,000 in, like in places, Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. So my question is, and this comes, comes back as uh, a complaint from beneficiaries everywhere we go, mm -hmm. uh, how much of your time do you spend in the places where people live that you are trying to help? And if, if you don't spend enough time, how do you ensure that report writing that has become perfected as a technique does not blind your eyes? Thank you. Well, the, what, the last part. The How do you ensure yep. that report writing that has oh, become right. has become a perfected okay. technique does not blind your eyes to see effectiveness of aid? Thank you. No, great question. The whole area of aid or, or uh, foreign assistance is a very, very complex one. Let me give a, a few key comments. To your last point, the key thing that we do is to, to very carefully select which grantees that we work with. We make sure that we have a good relationship with them. We travel a lot. There's a part of that that you might say is quote unquote checking up on the grantee, but it's I like to position it a little bit uh, uh, better than that because it is better uh, than that. That's a very important thing that we do. The, the other thing that you have to keep in mind about our work is a lot of times what we're doing is we're developing broad horizontal interventions like a new vaccine that other organizations are then taking. And so we also work with organizations like Global Fund and Gavi and we pay a lot of attention to what they're doing uh, to ensure the effectiveness. And there, there are some times where the, the assistance doesn't end up where you want it to be. Um, you know, if, if, you, if you pay $100 to vaccinate kids and only $80 gets spent on vaccinating kids, you're disappointed. $20 went someplace you didn't want it to go. $80 went to vaccinate kids. And so I always want to balance, you know, are we uh, headed in the direction that we need to be? The other thing I want to say about foreign assistance is a broader point. Uh, there are some people who have criticized foreign assistance, uh, folks like Demisa Moyo. And I think it's very important to, to have a more nuanced discussion of foreign assistance. I think there's no question, I think we can all agree there's some foreign assistance that's not very smart. It was politically motivated in ways that didn't have the intended impact. Uh, maybe it was trying to buy friendship or something. There is foreign assess assistance that is very smart. I can tell you very definitively, for every $1,500 you cut out of foreign assistance for vaccinating children, a child will die. That is the epidemiological estimates that have been gone over and over and over. And so there is, in my view, smart aid, and there is not so smart aid. And what we have to do is to be committed to smart aid, and we have to, as you suggest, effectively use our relationships with our grantees, donor 
partners, developing country partners in order to ensure that it's effectively used. And it's not an easy job, but it's an important one. Thank you. Hi, my name is Linda Bai. I'm a first year Master of Public Policy student. Thank you for being here. Mm -hmm. And what I wanted to ask is um, to, for you to speak a little bit to how you involve um, kind of civil society organizations, people from the nonprofit sector, from the public sector, in the formulation of larger program strategies, um, especially considering how much work is done in developing countries. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm sorry, how we involve the partners? In yeah, kind of in the larger processes of determining, you know, program priorities, the types yeah. of programs that would be most effective for different regions, um, you know, for different types of areas, yeah. and how much um, of that feedback is really taken into account when you yeah. do kind of on a larger, broader scope define your program area. I'll give you a little bit of a case <clears throat> case study. Essentially what we do is very much like what I would have done in business. I, I make sure that a team has the right uh, aspirational goal, uh, and that's iterative. Uh, I make sure that they put in place a clear strategy that includes a theory of change, an action plan. Theory of change is what is it that's going to make a difference and get you to that aspirational goal action plan is what are you going to do the delta between the two is what your partners are going to do because it's the work of your partners plus you that add up to the theory of, of change and then we get into a rhythm where we do an annual review of our execution against that strategy and then probably every three to five years we've learned enough where we have to make major adjustments to the strategy and then we do a strategy refresh so that's just the process that we're in. It's not unlike what I might do if I were uh, running a given type of, of, of business. As part of doing both that strategy development, strategy refresh, uh, our best teams basically develop that aspirational goal in conjunction with a set of, uh, of uh, advisors. Some of them might be potential grantees, but actually most of them are not. Most of them are independent thinkers. You take, for example, our uh, maternal neonatal child health team. When I first came into the foundation in 2008, they were trying to get their 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 strategy uh, completed and approved, and they had a set of advisors that included, you know, universities like Johns Hopkins, you know, partners on the ground in the in the developing world, and they put that body of evidence together into into. Uh, developing a strategy that is in, was intended to work in three areas, uh, uh, northern Nigeria, Ethiopia, and two of the poorer states in India, to uh, understand neonatal mortality and figure out the set of, of interventions, in particular uh, frontline health work that would make a difference on, uh, on that. And so, that was something that they had to, to, it's an intellectual challenge where you have to dissect that step by step using good input from uh, a range of, of partners and then ultimately your grantees. Thank you. Hi, my name is Shloka and I'm a grad student here. Um, thank you so much for being here today. My question had to do with, um, or rather it's my understanding that the Gates Foundation is more propriety and proprietary and confidential in their approach to IP development as opposed to the rest of the development sector, which is more open source. So I was wondering if that was the case, and if so, why that might be. No, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't necessarily describe it that way. I mean, if you, I mean, it depends upon what your benchmark is. If you compare it to academia and how uh, people publish, re how long it takes them to publish research. Uh, you know, I don't think there's there's any difference there. Let me just say, I think it's super important that we be transparent about the work that we're doing. I think it's important that we share our strategies. I think it's important that we share what grants that we're making. If you go up to our website, you can see what grants uh, we've made. If you go, you can see what our strategy uh, definitions are for each of those 25 areas. I think that level of transparency is very important because it's a part of the intellectual uh, dialogue that we have. Are there things I think we can do to be even better at that? Sure. But for the most part, I actually think we're, we're pretty good. And it's not about, uh, you know, our desire to protect proprietary intellectual property. In fact, that's probably more the interest sometimes of the grantees. Uh, but generally, we have provisions that information has to be shared in order for it to be to inform better practices. Thank you. Thank you. 
Hi, uh, thanks for being here. My name is Adam. I'm a student at the Graduate School of Education just across the square. Sure. Um, last time we got to hear from Hillary Pennington, which was nice, so this is from my week of gates. Um, and before I came here, I was at New School's Venture Fund, where I got to spend some of your foundation's money on education reform, so thanks for that as well. You're welcome. <laughs> um, uh, earlier, you referenced what I wanted to ask you about. You referenced um, coming to Massachusetts to hear a little bit of the criticism of the, the foundation's work in the education space, and so I wanted to give you a chance to talk about this. And specifically, uh, I think some of the feedback that, that I've heard in working in this sector is um, people are, some people are worried about the implications on the democratic institution of public education mm -hmm. with uh, big philanthropic dollars coming in. Um, mm -hmm. And so uh, I wanted to ask you maybe a question about sort of how does sort of the ethics of democracy play into a foundation as large as Gates or in the in yeah. public space? And, and maybe even if there's differences in how you work domestically and, and sort of the ethics of working in foreign countries with different regulation regimes. Yeah, to, well, on that latter point, I, I think the principles really are the same. We, we are uh, not only regulated by, by U.S. law, but we hold the same values and principles wherever we, we operate. Um, so that, that, I think, is fairly important. Uh, to your question about the democratic process and the appropriate voice of philanthropy, I think it's super important that we carefully um, approach our role in the, in the dialogue. Um, I mentioned earlier that uh, we are a small percentage of the overall spending in U.S. Ed education, and that is true. It's, it's less than 0.1%. Uh, percent. On the other hand, some people would say we have a disproportionate voice in and how things are influenced. And we, we feel that that's a very important responsibility that we hold. And that's why a key part of what we have to do is to seek input about how people are viewing, uh, are viewing the goals. Uh, some, some of the critics, uh, well, let me actually set a, a context. And I was uh, chatting with David Gergen about this. It's really unfortunate that the whole dialogue uh, around many things, but especially U.S. education, has become so polarized. polarized. I mean, what, what we collectively can and should care about is student outcomes. You know, and you know, we don't. We believe in teaching. We think teaching is a very uh, important profession. It's critical to to economic development. It's critical to, to democracy. And so, and we think public education is, is uh, critically important. We are not about privatizing education. Uh, we don't think that, that we don't support vouchers. We don't believe that, that charter schools are the answer. We think they may be part of the answer, but they're actually publicly funded in a way to try and improve uh, practice. And so I think the thing that really has got to have happen is we've got, as a society, we have to have more of a, a uh, appropriate discussion of what is working, what isn't, what is the evidence of those, those successes and, and failures. And so I'm spending a lot of time with our team here learning about the, the evidence, understanding the criticisms uh, of the research, seeing where we would need to tune or not. And I just think that's a part of us representing that principle, that we have to hold our role in this process to a very high standard. Thanks, Adam. Hi, my name is Livio, and I'm, I'm a student from Italy. I'm here at the Kennedy School. And um, I was reading this article about when Bill Gates went to Chad and he was working um, in this rural clinics bringing vaccination. And he was saying that these this women that were working like seven, eight, nine, ten hours to get to this rural clinic to get this vaccination. So my question is like, how do you improve access to vaccine? How do you expand the access? Do you go about improving cold chains? Or do you go about having technology that can improve the stabilities of vaccine, which is the approach? Right? Yeah. Well, it's, it, that, that's interesting. I was actually with Bill in Nigeria right before he went to, to chat. So I had a lot of opportunity to discuss those issues with him that was in the context of Nigeria. And what we were doing is we were looking at the challenges of the polio program in northern Nigeria, and then the problems with polio uh, and other vaccination in, in Chad. Chad has one of the lower routine immunization uh, coverage rates in the world. Uh, the, 
So, you know, it's a, you have to work on a combination of things. You, you have to have the vaccines available. You have to have frontline health workers with the training to be able to deliver the vaccine. You have to have the supply chain, including the cold chain, to get the vaccines to there. Uh, you can make things better. The more that you can have vaccines be needle-free, the easier it is for them to be administered uh, or, you know, taken orally. The more that you can use uh, thermal, you know, develop thermal sta stable vaccines. Um, one of the things that we think about is how do you get consistency in the packaging of vaccines so that it makes it simpler at that, that frontline health post. I mean, if you require special refrigeration for different vaccines, that makes it complicated because it's packaged differently. So it's a very rich intellectual challenge to, to work on. But as I mentioned earlier, extremely important because for every kid we can get vaccinated, uh, you dramatically increase the, the ability to, to save their life. I, just, I follow up one second because I asked you that question because um, we saw there was a big problem. So we started, you know, our dean always yeah. asks us, like, what can we do, what can we do? So we work on a project. Yeah. That, uh, <laughs> so, I should have asked you the answer. Yeah, right. So we developed this project uh, that basically can deliver vaccine, like thermostable vaccine, and it's a platform technology. And um, we want the business plan competition and the other business school. And then I go and check, you know, the building gates, the Linda Gates Foundation, and basically, it seems that the developing thermostable vaccine is not a priority. So I was thinking, like, what is that approach? In is it like going about putting the cold chain in place everywhere, and or is it investing in technology? So then I was just very curious about that. No, we're, we're uh, somehow the, there's a misimpression uh, there, maybe because of things we have on the website. But we do we do work on on thermal stability. Sometimes the issue is just when when will the thermal stable vaccine be available and then you get into what's the most efficient solution is the most efficient solution to figure out how to improve the cold chain for the types of vaccines that are available today or to get the thermal stable vaccine unfortunately for a lot of the thermal stability uh, as i would call it it's out in the future and we've got problems to solve today so that may have been where the misimpression came from thank you i think we only have time for maybe one last question Thank you so much for being here. I'm Olga. I'm also a joint degree student with the Kennedy School and the Business School. Um, and I'm curious to hear about what's next for the Gates Foundation. What do you see as the big opportunities and challenges for growth? Uh, and also, additionally, in the space of foundations and philanthropy. Yeah. Great question. Yeah. The, uh, well, and it actually relates to a question, Kendall, that you asked that I probably didn't completely answer up front, which is, what do I see ahead? In the past decade, there's been huge growth. Uh, and one of the consequences of significant growth in, that you see in business, and I've also now seen it in philanthropy, is that you tend to get siloed. And that's because when you're trying to grow rapidly, the organizational strategy is typically to figure out how to segment the overall uh, organization and its priorities and then tell leaders to run as fast as they can in order to go deliver on that. And that is a good thing in that it delivers on the growth, but it's a challenging thing and then it also tends to create some silos. So one of the most significant in initiatives we have underway right now under my leadership is called Global Redesign, where I'm trying to restructure the way in which we work on our global programs in order to break down some of those silos, increase the collaboration. I make that symbolic of what I think the next 10 years are going to be like. Uh, the next 10 years will not grow the way the last 10 years did. I mean, it's almost you know, obvious, but I'll just state it. We went kind of from zero to four billion. I think you know we might end up increasing 10, 20 percent over a decade. Who knows? But it's not going to be that kind of significant growth. So what that means is this decade, I think, will be very much characterized by great stewardship. What can we do to increase our capacity for impact with the resources we have? And that's where I think some of my skills and discipline are a contribution, you know, because I think about how do you run the processes, how do you ensure that you have the best relationships with grantees, et cetera. If you can take the same resource and increase your uh, capacity for impact by 7% per year, 
I'll just use that as a conceptual number. You'll double your capacity for impact in 10 years. It's just the so-called rule of seven. If I could figure out how we could increase our capacity for impact 10% per year, we double in seven years. And so that doesn't mean we double our resources. It means we double our capacity for impact by being more effective <coughs> in how we do our work. And I'm, I'm very committed to that, working with the team to do it. And I've been very honored to be here uh, at the school. I thank you very much. And I thank, uh, thank all of you for what you do. I hope you follow your passion and go out and change the world. Thank you.